I don't remember Plot Plotinus. Sorry? I don't remember Plotinus. I actually didn't. I'm not familiar with him. Is he Roman? Plotinus is Greek, and he came up with the idea of the process of emanation, and he described God as being ineffable. And I see. He had some variation on the problem of evil, which the I think the Epicureans or the Stoics had an answer to, but it wasn't very convincing. It was like um, they gave three different options, right. and they just said God was willing and able to prevent evil but just chose not to or something and so it wasn't very convincing but Plotinus had this whole concept of which he took from Plato of like there's God which is the one and then God is like a light emanating all these rays and then he creates the divine mind through the emanation of the rays and the divine mind creates the world soul which then creates through its process of trying to emulate the divine mind and the divine mind's process of trying to emulate God it then creates individual souls which then emanate and create the bodies of the people in a material world and the reason why you have evil is his explanation was because the the further away you get from the source of god and his light that there's not him so he's not responsible for the non-him for the material world which is evil and uh, there's a lot of other stuff in there but he talks about how like you know, God, you can't say anything about God. God is ineffable. And how does he know all this? Like he's, well, he's had a mystic insight. He's like through ecstasy, he's discovered this stuff. He's yeah. unified himself with God. But um, yeah, he had, so he apparently had quite a lot of influence on Christianity, but it's just full of, filled with like, it doesn't make any sense at all. And even as I was going through it, I was thinking there's no way you can believe this and feel comfortable it, it has to be a rationalization. There is no possibility. I cannot conceive of someone genuinely thinking, oh, this makes sense in reason. It's so riddled with, it just feels like absolute nonsense. So that was yeah. my reaction to it. Yeah. It, I mean, that's all I can even say of those things. Just, I'm not even sure what psychologically drives that other than just a rejection of reason. Like, I don't think there's anything else to it. Yeah. Yeah, me neither. I, by the way, I, I found there was a random passage I saw quoted by Nietzsche in Human All Too Human, and he describes Xerxes. Uh, he describes evil. He talks about evil and Xerxes. Do you, yeah. do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Xerxes is the Persian emperor yes. during the, the wars. I forget the Persian War. Yes. And he talks about how people conceptualize someone who does bad to them someone as being evil but then he goes on to discuss xerxes like swatting a fly he doesn't feel that he's doing bad it's just a guy someone in his way and it's just swatting like the same feeling you have swatting a fly xerxes has when he yes. what he, he gave an example of like he quartered some guy who worked for him he, he i don't know it's whatever that torture thing is that they did but he just quoted him and he's like well it's not that he felt that he was doing bad it's just there was a fly in his way and he squatted him and it uh, made me want to read some of that at some point because it sounds it's it's interesting psychologically because it ties up with what brandon said about misconceptualizing evil is not it's recognizing your value and therefore it's turning against it in some metaphysically um what how did he describe it like some metaphysical way where you can't get underneath it it's just literally he doesn't see the value that you have at all and so he doesn't feel anything it's not it, to him he's not committing evil he's just swatting a fly and that analogy yeah. between swatting a fly and xerxes was i don't know that was interesting that was illuminating to me so it's uh motivated me yeah it's not like an intention of like some sort of intention to seek evil like satan or something it's just they don't even think in those terms or i mean whatever terms they're thinking in right or wrong or whatever you judge them as they're still acting in a way that they think they want to do it's not like it's some unhuman or non-human we have thinking it precisely is human like human in the sense that it's not beyond the, the nature of humanity it's not like right. oh they're not human it's not like right oh they're against like that is not the nature to be that way but it's not it's not our nature to be that way but 
it's not like it's against the identity even when right. you have that game capacity. The capacity right. is still there. Right. Yes. I thought the intelligence and creativity and that was the analogy you made to the fly because it never occurred to me that I've squatted a bug before and it never occurred to me that, oh, okay, that's what he might feel the same, the same indifference, which is, uh, yeah. yeah, like I said, illuminating. I read some boy has as well, the story of the Phoenix. Do you remember yeah. that? You, yeah. I, I also, it, it made me, it made me feel what I felt when I was listening to the lecture about Plotinus it's like it's just nonsense what's all this stuff about a, a, a secret being handed down from yeah. the secret whatever it is I, I don't know being handed down from generation to generation but it's ineffable no one knows it's just in right. a look <laughs> what what was well I don't even know what to take away from that um in a way it is that is the way people conceptualize these mystical things I, mean, I don't think Borges is saying taking a position as much as he pretends to be an anthropologist. He describes things. So he just came up with this system and he's describing it as if he's an anthropologist studying it. And that's the approach you should take. Like almost as if you were the, the person analyzing these philosophers. Right. Why do they think it? How do they think it? Right. And it, the ultimate idea in this is that of that cult is that we are all unified under this sect that it originates from the beginning of time that I, um it makes everybody together in some sense in a way it collectivizes them and it gives them a unitary identity all language stems from it all knowledge stems from it that we've grown yeah. over time but like imagine if you were like the first people the first civilization ever or the first people to step out of Africa. Something we all originate from there ultimately. So he's in a way saying that this mystical insight stems from our past. It's like a collective identity, like almost like racial identity, that there's some knowledge within us based on our past, which is mystical, obviously, but that's the kind of view it is. Right. Okay. But it's it's ineffable. No one says anything. They all just through right. a look. They transmit this ineffable. Right. So what is? I don't get what the what is that? What's the point of that? Like that they see it. In yeah, a I understand. Way. Like um, sorry, con continue. A wordless way in a way that yeah, it is ineffable to them. And the point of that is just that it's it's like the foundation of it. Like. It needs to be ineffable to even make sense to them for it to exist even. I think that's how I take it. Right. But why? Why does it need to be ineffable? Why? I don't know if there's context here, but I just it just made me think of Plotinus and the same nonsense. Why is it to be that way? Yeah. I think some of that is clues from the, the story, I think. I don't quite remember all the details. Yeah. I think it's just a description of a mystical belief system. Why did it have to be that way? I think I think it's because, well, if they're claiming that their origin goes back centuries, even before any memory, then it would be that you can't even conceptualize what was there to begin with. There's no way to verbalize it, no way to say it because it's so far back in history. It's okay. like a, almost like intrinsic knowledge, almost like platonic knowledge, like in the sense that you, knowledge is reminiscence, but since we can't remember, since we can't verbalize it in the past, it's as if we can't say anything. Right. I also read the lottery, like the infinite lottery just keeps expanding until you know, that yeah. there's a lottery on the punishment and the kind of punishment and then where it happens, how it happens. Yeah. And that, that you said, I think in the notes that I took from the stories you mentioned, you said it was like trying to draw an analogy between luck and life, between lottery and luck or like, like general so, luck in life. Yeah. Mm, okay. I don't remember what, that one. Actually. 
yeah okay. very much i yeah. think there was like the least important of them right that i mentioned right, right, right. i don't even actually remember why i mentioned that one because that seemed right. very um, obtuse to me that story yeah by the way i was thinking about three men at the olympics game olympic games was that all there was to it was there more to the story because when I, when I think about it, I'm like, wow, the disinterested man who's just going to the Olympics sounds so boring and terrible. He just sits there. Like, why is he even there in the first place? What's up yeah, with I him? Think, I don't think there is any more to it. It's just and, like a quick analogy, I believe, in one of the dialogues, I think. And that had appeal? That this disinterested man has an appeal? Like, he just sits there. Like, what is he even doing? No, I He's think just it was just sitting. an example. Right. I thought it was just an example given by Socrates, probably. Right. Okay. It's describing that this is a truly disinterested man who's truly interested in philosophy. Is a disinterested man? That's probably what he said or something. Or right. argued. By analogy, you're like this guy who goes to the. They're saying they're taking that and they're trying to draw an analogy for the way you should be in general in life. And so the the man, the pinnacle of who they want to be, is this man who is at a at the Olympics for conceivably no reason at all, other than just to, I don't know, to passively sit. And I don't, I don't get it. Well, it's a bizarre, I understand that it's a basis for the psychology, but the idea that this man who has no, is just sitting there for no reason at all and watching with no interest at all, doesn't make any sense. It's bizarre. Because pure knowledge that is closer to pure reason or something like that, right. closer to an ideal state of knowledge. Right. Oh, I think that's more what it is. Right. And that is more ethically legitimate in Socrates' eyes because it's a true pursuit of knowledge without regard for strictly the material or anything. It's right. knowledge itself. Maybe. Which was maybe. seen as... Yeah, maybe he wanted to see, maybe the analogy was he wanted to, the guy, the pinnacle, the guy who was disinterested, just wanted to see who would win, but without, for whatever reason, without any other interest. Yeah, it, it is something you would see throughout different dialogues that Socrates may often state something that's along the lines of, is better like contemplation itself, is itself more desirable? And even Aristotle thought that to some degree. Right. Not in the same way, but to some degree he did. Yeah. That contemplation is this desirable state of philosophy. Yeah. Socrates just goes even further, even to say that almost that the purpose of philosophy is death because that's like the period. I forget the actual statement, but there is a line in the Phaedo where he's dying, where he tries to get someone to say, oh yeah, death really isn't that bad at all. Right. Yeah, I, there's some reason for it. Because... Yes. Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I remember what you're talking about. There was a quote about death being the ultimate end of a platonic morality, yes. but obviously you can't advocate that directly. I remember what you're talking about. Yeah. Teleology is the premise that purpose is operative somewhere in the universe. and But teleology means, it could mean somewhere but it doesn't mean the whole the universe as a whole has a purpose right like te teleology in, in the ancient greece was that that if you're a teleologist you believe the whole there was a purpose to everything but teleology itself now is it can be in different things right so it's not a metaphysical thing well teleology is just the idea that things go towards some end i mean telos is just end in Greek, yeah. it means end. So it's the study of ends. Right. And literally speaking, like it could be some advocate that it's sentient or driven by a God that the purpose is divine, guided by God, or it could be just natural, where, where you can think of, say, any processes as a beginning and an end. Like even like, let's see an example. Say you have a rock rolling down the hill. There's an end to that process. And there's no isolated process. Things always have a complete beginning and end like that, or okay. a process like that. 
they go towards some end and they complete their action or complete okay. their process. So it's just to say that all actions go towards some end. Things don't just happen and that's it. There's a process that they end up somewhere and then they can start another process or cause another process. Okay. But it's not that. So it could be a sentient thing guided by God or it could be just natural, not guided by any sentient or knowledge or divine entity. You right. could go either way. Okay. Got it. So it tells more about the natural teleology. Although he may have believed in a God, but a God that was not like sentient really. Like I'm not really sure about that or it's unclear to me, but not like saying that God created the world and decided what the ends would be. Not yep. like that. Yep, yep. All right. Okay. So it is, you're saying that if you're a teleologist, it's mutual. Like if you're a teleologist, then you can't also be a mechanist. Like you can't view right. the universe in some respect as mechanistic. And at the same right. time, view parts of the universe as teleological. Is that? Yeah, I would say they're incompatible. Okay, you're one cool. or the other. You can't be both. Okay. I Because I think that. to be a teleologist would be that things can't just be things bouncing around. Because they... There's something bigger than, I don't want to say bigger, but there's other things to it than the mere event is also the end they end up with. Where do they go? Well, that sort of brings me to my next question. When we discussed, you explained to me the billiard ball metaphysics. And I was then thinking later, well, couldn't I say that, you know, we're saying that everything reduces to motion, like on this billiard board table, We've just there's nothing starting it. There's just all these things moving. But couldn't I say that it's in the nature of these atoms to just move around and bounce off each other? And that's it. That's just in their nature. Just like we say free will is caused, but it's also free will. It's in it's free will is a kind of cause. Can't you just say atoms are a kind of cause and they they just motion. They just do motion. That's that's their nature. Is, I mean, is there that anything? Much is that much is fine i think the issue is are there other ways things can happen too is can you have that plus others i mean at the same time with the same entity Are you sure you can have that motion exists that nature of movement exists but can you also in combination <clears throat> with say final causes as in what end are they going towards i mean can you have both if you get a both that you're automatically adding things that a pure mechanist wouldn't. They would disagree that there's anything that they go towards that it reduces and there is nothing else to it. I mean, it's okay. whether or not you believe there is this premise and others. If it's just right. this premise and you reject the rest, then you'd be a mechanist. But if you accept this as possible and others at the same time, then you're not a mechanist because you're accepting that there's more than one level of analysis here okay all right i need to think about that one a bit more you said in your remember you wrote up yes. a little instruction pamphlet on how to research yes. philosophers yeah and you said this there are many aspects to consider many ideas that you wouldn't even know to consider sometimes even considerations where they are responding to specific philosophers or other times their ideas appear as if these as if they are niche curiosities that have no practical use. So from what I've figured out so far, it does seem like I can see how philosophy is unfolding and there is a lot of, there's few distinct ideas. There's a lot of variation on old ideas. And so if you want to learn philosophy, you can simply focus on the fundamental ideas right. when they originated. And then from there, it's pretty easy to make sense of the variations, right? Like uh, um, Plotinus's emanations, for example, which seems like absolute nonsense, but given Plato's myth about the world of forms, you can make sense of it pretty quickly, right? And so yeah. <clears throat> I was just thinking like, is this, is it ever a good strategy to bother with any sort of niche curiosities of philosophers? Because like, why would you take, for example, Plotinus? Like, maybe he does have some 
you know, one or two really yeah. random insights on psychology. Like, would, does it really make sense to steep yourself in 99% no. nonsense as opposed to just, I don't know, go to a psychology book, which may have even extracted yeah. those two insights. Like that seems well, it, when you're approaching philosophy, it just seems as a strategy way better to focus on the, um, the, unpre the unprecedented ideas. Well, let me check that you didn't misunderstand me. And I was trying to say that sometimes a philosopher appears as if there is no practical use, therefore you shouldn't study it, which I would agree if it's no practical use. Yeah. Don't study it. But the things to consider is that you might just not be aware of what the actual practical use is, even if on the surface it seems like it doesn't. That's what I was trying to point out. It's really uh, okay. hard to All tell. Right. That's what I mean. You have to consider that. I'm not saying that's the decision where you make the decision, but you have to be aware that you might not be aware of what's important or value. Okay. You might need to consult other sources or talk to other people before you like leave it off as worthless. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. I, I guess I was making a different point. I was almost riffing off what you were saying, but that wasn't your point. Okay. Yeah. But you agree, even though this is a separate point from what you were saying, you do agree with that, right? That like, yeah, I agree with you. Okay. I agree with what your point was. Cool. Like where Peacock mentioned, like these might be interesting, but they're not that important to study much because they have very minimal impact and they're quite derivative, right. but they could be of some value. And he pointed out the value he did see, which mm. isn't that much, but there's a few points that are interesting, right. that are actually insightful. Right. Like Epicurean okay. Swerve is like the most insightful idea I've heard out of a lot of the lectures because it's like, a mind blowing event like he's noticed like wow that's what the arbitrary is that's indeterminacy that's what it means to say that things are without identity like it really gets to that point right in a very graphic and illustrative way right the epicurean stab the stab I the epicurean I stab Talking no, the, his example of walking down the street, minding his oh. own business, and then... Oh, that one, yeah. Yeah. That was a great example. Okay. Um, let's see what I... I'll find the relevant parts here for you. Uh, I found... I drew this connection. I was reading... So the actual quote is read, and then the... Bolded is all supplementary, so you don't need to read that. But this is, um, I read this in the, in the book of, of, you know, common fallacies in economics. Yeah. This idea of in the long run, we're all dead, which apparently is like, a, I know Keynes said that. And apparently, I guess it's common enough, this perspective that he mentioned it he says these mm -hmm. are shallow wisecracks this it made me try to draw the the like i was thinking about the um he he talked about in the lectures the cyrenaics mm -hmm. who had this doctrine of eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we shall die and they were like that they were similar to the sophists and uh yeah it made me draw the connection between that attitude and like i don't know whoever says in the long run we're all dead isn't it the same thing and same with this um, this thief here who I quoted, this uh not thief, this uh arms dealer who says like money's the best thing in the world. And you know, great principles and noble virtues are all very well in the long run, but from day to day it's the it's like the little things, the money, the whatever the pleasures. I forget why Keen said it though. I don't know oh, what okay. he was responding to. Yeah, I don't I know mean, why that's out of context. You're right. I mean, that's the first thing I would ask. I actually don't know. I mean, right. I think, I mean, I think there is a relationship there as far as he is saying something about distinguishing short term from long term and that there's some more value in the short term that might be misjudged. Right. I think that's kind of what's at least the relationship there. 
that there's a judgment about long and short term that is probably misguided. That's where I think it's related. Right. More than likely. Right. Got it. Um, Let me get rid of this stuff. Yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about causes, specifically in history. So take, for example, there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion about depressions and how you need to do everything you can. Like you have to save the economy at all costs. That's the most important thing. Um, And it doesn't mean it, it doesn't matter if you have to print money as much as possible. Like the first focus is simply to save the economy. That's often used as a rationalization. Why? Because if you look at history, you see in Germany, when did people start listening to Hitler? Well, when they had the great depression, and so my, I was starting to think, well, how do you know what's fundamental? Like, maybe this is a bad example because I don't know if either of us have amazing historical knowledge about what happened, but how do you, you know, like, is it economics or is it Hitler? Like, if there was no Hitler, would you still get World War II? If there was Hitler, but you had no depression, would you still get World War II? Like, that, it's, I don't even, yeah, I don't know what, do you know, how to think about that at all? Have you given that any thought? I think what you're phrasing here makes sense that if you take out one premise, would this thing still happen? In a way you could think of it like, you're suggesting that they're, you're looking for what the essential cause is or the most essential thing to focus on. So you could just set on all the things that you think might be relevant that seem to have an impact because you would want to throw out irrelevant things that, well, it's hard to know what's irrelevant even, but you could take a yeah. handful of things and see if taking that out would change anything, which is, of course, difficult to think about, but you could think about what would change or it, it's hard to work backwards, but you could take that, the fact that the war broke out and think about what was there when it happened. like. You could think of, say, invading Poland by Nazi Germany was basically what started it, like the starting event. You could break that apart to say, like, what was went into that event? You say Hitler's decisions. And if you take out that invasion, of course, World War II wouldn't happen in that way. But then you could think about some other things before that. It is, of course, very difficult, but I think taking things out is a way to look at what's important because if something is taken out and it doesn't change much, right. then it would not be essential. Right. Like you could think about was, was FDR really important? I doubt it personally. So you could say FDR? if FDR was there, and yeah, the US president at the time. Uh, okay. Like I'm not sure how important he was as far as it coming, like World War II breaking out. But then we could see there's Germany is involved with so much of it that we could place a lot of German history as relevant to causing World War II. Because you can right. see that everything revolving around the initial outcomes are all about Germany's issues. Right. You see that everything is like pointing to Germany. Right. Like somebody's mad at Germany, Germany's mad at somebody else. Right. There's a conflict that existed from 20 years before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But there's also Napoleon conquered Germany and Italy. And apparently that had a profound impact on the German culture at the time. Yeah. When they were conquered by Napoleon. And same on Russia. And so you're like, it's hard. It's just, there's so many variables. I, I, it's, uh, it's like the question then becomes, okay, well, let's say you didn't have Hitler, but Germany was still embarrassed and angered by being conquered by France, Napoleonic France. And so what would, let's say Hitler didn't exist. What would Germany do then? Like, I don't, I don't even know how you'd begin to answer that. Cause like, what fact would you look at that has, has or hasn't been recorded to, to, to work that kind of thing out, like in terms of cause? 
I think a lot of it depends on how much you zoom in, because yeah. we could talk about, say, Germany reading Poland as more deliberate or direct thing in the way that you can zoom in on any, like if you imagine zooming in on a book, you could analyze sentence by sentence to see yeah. the progress of the story, which could be interesting and relevant, or you take a step back and analyze it by at the level of the chapter, like what was the main thing that happened in the chapter rather than going step by step. So it's a right. different type of analysis and the further back you go, the more philosophical it is. So if you think all the way back to between World War II and Napoleon, that gets more philosophical. Like what caused the change in Germany? There right. was a lot of philosophical change, especially with philosophy, especially in the government too. After like the 1870s, it became like a welfare state and the education system in Germany was more all about producing people that act for the sake of the state. So it's almost like Napoleon in a way could cause World War II, but that's more philosophical and like zoomed out more. That's the good level, like what changed in Germany is or within Europe itself that changed the way that war worked. So it really depends on what level of analysis, which is why history is so difficult because it's like everything in human history can be analyzed that way. Either zoom in or zoom out, like there's so much detail. How do you, when you're thinking of Aristotle's causes, for example, how do you make sure your every cause is on the right hierarchy? I'll try to give an example because I don't know if I'm wording that right. But what I'm saying is that, okay, let's say I want to ask myself, what is the cause of World War II? Now I use Aristotle's. Firstly, I guess the first question actually that I should be asking is, is his, met, is his concept, conception of the four causes actually even appropriate to history? Because it might Probably. not be, right? It might not be because Aristotle didn't analyze things in terms of history very much. Because, I right. mean, in a way, I'm not sure if there was a reason to. There wasn't that much to analyze or was much available to analyze. It's not like he knew much what was happening in China. Right. Or anything at all. So, okay. Um, but some of it could. Yeah. We could figure out how he would analyze it. At least basically the way he asked questions. Like, what is it that happened? How is it that happened? Why is it that happened? Questions like that. And that's like the four W's or the five W's, as I say, is always a place to start. I wouldn't exactly use the four causes. I think we would need to like translate them to history, like alter them and modify them. But final cause I think works great because a lot of things in history have to do with what people want to bring about. I think that's always oh, very final, important. Final cause. Is that oh, yeah. definitely in terms of intention by people. When people want to do something, that's when final cause matters. Like what did Hitler want to bring about? What did the German people want? What did, they, what did the US want? Is what are their desires and goals and values? So, the other ones might not work so great, but final cause would work great. But maybe we can try just to see how it would work in terms of like staying yeah. on the same level of the hierarchy. So what I mean yeah. is, because, you know, I could say, oh, the material is uh, tanks, German weaponry. Yeah, economic just, stuff in a way. And then I could the say- cause. You well, know, let's, let's start with material. I'm just trying to give you an example of how you can sure. go wrong first, and then we'll go to it. Yeah. So I feel like this could be wrong, right? Because I could say, oh, well, then the efficient cause is Hitler sending the command to Hitler sending command to start war. You know what I'm saying? Like this, there's yeah. already something off here because I'm, I'm going on all these different layers. Yeah. Um, and then formal is, uh, I don't even know what formal would be. Um, this, I'm not let's sure. just say, um 
I don't know, but my, my, I get, you get my point, right? I'm saying like, there's yeah. already some error here when I'm going like there's tanks and then suddenly it's Hitler sending a command with his voice. Like, so what I'm, what I'm trying to get at before we go deeper is yeah. How do you, how would you ensure that you're even not analyzing things on the correct layer first? So it's all aligned across all the different kinds of causes. Um, if they're like relatively on the level, you would think there's the same genus. It's hard to say precisely. What is the level of analysis? In a way, each of these things is a level of analysis. Each cause is a level. They're not necessarily on the same level. I mean, this is the distinction. Like, final cause is one level, material cause is another level. There are different ways of analyzing that they all fit together, though. You know, as an example for final cause, I could think of a few. And what I'm saying is for each one, there's probably a few. I could say, Hitler's appetite for power over people, Hitler's desire to destroy Jews, like uh, it's kind of all over the place, yeah? Yeah, you got to find which ones are most important, Like, which doesn't mean it's uh, part of the process, but... Right, German's desire for revenge, like, and then, you know, which out of all of these, which ones align with the material causes like it's pretty difficult when you're not doing it just for like one isolated action you're talking about an entire war um we could split it up into subjects like economic so economic material causes final cause formal and efficient political or social because all those things are relevant to history oh, I see. okay so you could do it by subject i think okay economic political what well, do you want to try one maybe we'll try yes. one of them all right let's try economic yes so material would be just well literally the materials maybe we want to split up war as well war should be separate so like economics say what resources do germany have like what did they produce what did they make that uh. well i might want to avoid the warfare stuff it's hard to say like tanks i'm thinking more about the economics of the not war economics just like what did they produce in general ah, that's in what I, that's what i was thinking yeah like the yeah. materials the materials of yeah. war are, are soldiers weapons and tanks right well, are, well i'm just talking about the materials of the causes of world war ii not the the war itself. I'm splitting it up in terms of, I'm putting war as a separate category. Oh, okay, wait, I've misunderstood. So could you say that again? I thought we're doing the economic causes of World War II. Yeah, but I mean in terms of not the, the warfare aspects of it, like what led to it, not during it. So you have to consider what they produce. That's what I mean. The economic things they produce, not the the war economy. I would have thought that that's what it would be. Just like when you say a material cause is, I don't know. Let's say the material cause of a ball rolling down the hill is is a ball. If we could do both, good tanks, bombs, bullets. But what else do they make there? I mean, they make pharmaceuticals. That was special to Germany. I mean, I'm just listing things that can contribute to it. Economic issues or concerns. Uh, shouldn't we isolate just those things that are unique to a war, though? Like, if we say pharmaceuticals... No, I don't think so. And I could... Oh, okay. That's kind of what I'm saying. I mean, does building tanks cause war? I mean, if you think it did in some way, sure, list it. But these but, are just the material things that were produced in some capacity. Okay, that was my tanks. understanding. Yes. Because, like, same with a, a ball. Does does a ball cause itself to roll down a hill? That was my understanding. And you say no, but the ball is the material cause because it's the nature of a ball which allows it to roll down the hill. The efficient is the finger pushing it. And then the formal, I actually, I don't know what the formal is, but yeah. yeah. So is that wrong? Oh. No, I, I think it's wrong. It's that 
you need to include all the other things that are produced to think about what is the cause of it. I mean, the okay. cause isn't just the tanks or bombs. I mean, yeah, that could be part of it. I mean, I don't think, I usually think in terms of war intentions as separate, like the analysis in terms of war, I think it's different. So I was just speaking of the economic nature of Germany that would contribute to war, to the outbreak of war, which could be issues with, say, inflation, but that's not a material cause. Material cause here would be the stuff, the stuff of the tangible things within Germany. Oh wait, but then, but then, aren't you, aren't you in this case? If you're saying, I, okay, I've understood it differently. I see why we're differing. I've understood the economic cause of war being like the material for war. Like, oh, this is tricky because like the, not, not the cause of the depression, for example, in Germany, but the cause of the war. Am I understanding correctly? That's what I'm thinking of. What, what economically led to war? So yeah, that's for sounds example, reasoning. Yeah. Okay. I mean, maybe uh, it, this does apply. We're not saying tanks and bombs and producing those things. Yeah. Is wrong. It's just that you have to include more things than that. I mean, that could have been part of their economic system in Germany, producing airplanes and tanks. But there's mm. also other things you must consider. You do need okay. to consider the pharmaceuticals they produced or the natural resources or the stuff that you trade, the concrete stuff so, that might be desirable or that they might seek. So for example, analyzing their natural resources might point out that Germany had no resources available. They had nothing to build their country with. They had to go out. So that would explain being imperialistic because they're trying to get resources from other countries forcefully. And that would, that's what material cause would explain. So a lack of resources explains why they would want to seek invading other countries. So the material cause, could I not just say all economic goods and services available to them at yes. the time? Okay, let's go with that. that. That's gen general enough for us to start with efficient economic efficient causes means like a trigger right the agent yes. that came in and yes could uh, be a economic law could be that hitler i'm not Is no that... I, that would be more political so let's try to think more in terms of like i don't know a, a company or more economic related thing like stock market related maybe or um kind of things could that be um more like banking maybe i'm not sure what would cause something to happen economically um well a shortage of a supply of some kind perhaps why well, if you're desperately out of, say, I don't know, lumber, you might be more pushed to invade a country that has a lot of lumber. Because like that triggering event that the, say, a wildfire destroyed huge amounts of lumber, just as a random example, Maybe that might then. push you. Sure. Hyperinflation would work. Things like that. Okay. Let, let's go with it because we might, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm really, this is really just grabbing stuff in the dark, but yeah. just to test out the, formal and then the cause. formal cause is, remind me, it's like the, the formal is the actual end result, right? Is war, isn't it? Formal cause. I would say describing this when it's, what causes the war to be? Isn't it just war? Like that's the final and abstraction of the i think so let me look this up 
four causes. It's the formula. It's the uh, let's see. It's the abstraction that is non-unique in this situation, or it's the elements of it that are non-unique. What makes it what it is? What made it the word that it is economically? Uh, with history, I don't know. I don't answer know answer that really. And then the final cause might be, we can skip that then. The final cause would be restoration of economic power. I'm just sort of, again, stabbing in the dark just to get a feel for. Economic power. Yeah, sure. Like that. All right. Um, this is pretty hard. Yeah. Final cause would be things like, well, what did the people in Germany seek economically? Like they had yeah, restoration of economic power. Um, you could say they sought more natural resources. Say there was a seeking of oh. wealth or I'm just giving different examples. Yeah. Anything economic that is desired or is sought after by yeah. human action. Yeah. All right. This is pretty hard. Uh, it is. Just stay. I, I'm, pre hard. I'm pretty sure there's got to be a method. Someone's got to come up with it a is. method for this. Yeah. To Because you could, there's like so much, like you pointed out, so many facts. The question is, which ones are relevant? And, and on any given layer of analysis, which ones are on the right level? You know, like, because you can always take from yeah. different levels and then confuse everything up. Yeah, I think the best answer would be to develop a new a new one based on these ideas. Like this is a start, but I would like redo our result system for history. Right. It doesn't quite work well or as easily as to analyzing the nature of entities. This is very difficult. So Agreed. we gotta split it up. Agree. It has been done with a animal behavior in ways that are very insightful, but you had to completely redo the system. Not completely, but this is the inspiration, but we can alter it to make it fit, to ask the right questions. Uh, so, I mean, it points out the questions that it might be missing. Right. Like material cause wasn't so bad, but the other ones are very tricky to apply yeah. to historical processes. It's really broad. Also, we're already assuming that economics is a cause. But we know yes. from history, at least, that economics sometimes isn't a cause, right? Like sometimes people just want to kill other people, to put it really simply. I think sometimes, yes. Yeah. Sometimes it is the case. Yeah. It's like, in oh. a way, it's like, but in a way, it's hard to avoid that. There's always some economic motivation, I think, by someone if there's more than one person involved. <sighs> But it's very hard to say. Yeah. It's hard because I guess it's really a question of you have to keep in mind, like every time you identify a cause and you ask yourself, is this essential? You have to think of other examples. But history is littered with infinite facts, right? So yes. how do you how do you possibly sum that up and go, oh, here are examples of a war starting not because of this, and here are examples of a war starting because of this. Like it, there's like too much, too much information. In a way that there's, there will always be multiple, and that's the hard part. Yeah. Like I wish it was any easier, but we, I know in the way that Marx reduces, usually everything was economic. Right. Everything was economic to Marx. Right. It all reduced to economics, which, I mean, yeah, it's a relevant consideration, but is everything economic? Probably not. Is yeah, everything okay. political? No. Yeah. Sometimes it's multiple at once. Right. They don't reduce to each other. Right. They're just separate. Right. I mean, Mark said like everything reduced economics, but but you could say that, well, economics and politics and ultimately philosophy, like philosophy yeah. unifies it, but it can be split up into all these different things. Yeah. I, I I do think what you mentioned about the causes applied to biology, it it's probably helpful if you've got right. ton, tons of those examples and then you can try, I don't know if you're going to get an yeah. exact carryover, but you'd have right. a better 
understanding. Okay, let's, this is pretty hard. So let's uh, move on and try fit in a little bit more before we wrap up. Oh, by the way, do you know, I found out that Hitler, when he was rising to power, he rose on the slogan, making Germany great again. Yeah. And I, I thought that was, it's a bit of a, it's a very superficial link, but is that why people call Trump Hitler or equate him with Hitler or they used to? Do you know? Um, or is I, that just, you know, because they call a lot of people I Hitler. So I don't know. If... It was more for saying America first, oh. which is something that American fascists would say back in like the 1930s sometimes. Okay. And so they say, oh, fascist Hitler. That was the connection, really. Okay. That was the main reason people said that. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Anyway, I guess I brought this up because, yeah, like I pointed out, I've seen this that because of people's interpretation of history, they justify all kinds of different things. Like Charlie Munger, who's a partner of Warren Buffett of Berkshire Hathaway, it's a big investment fund. He says his lesson from the 1930s or before that from Germany, actually, from World War II is, you don't ever want to do anything to push an economy to collapse. So he's going to be advising all the officials in government and telling them print money as much as you can. You don't want the economy to collapse because if America, if the economy in America collapses, we'll get another Hitler. And that's like a reasoning based on his historical reasoning. Right. And that's why it got me thinking like, well, there are all kinds of people justifying all kinds of different views based on their take on history, based on their historical reasoning. We'll call it that is definitely an issue there. Like we don't, it's pretty hard to do. How do you know that what you're saying is true or not? Wait, is he saying that collapsing economies cause fascism? Yes. Or that saving economies no, causes no. chaos? His lesson was from World War II, you don't ever want to do anything to push an economy to collapse. Terrible things results. And well, then I would the have section... said the opposite. That's weird. Well, he's quite reputable. And so people yeah. are definitely will listen to him for sure. And, and then he, he says here, you know, the European economies are decimated. He, this is his lesson he took to the point that it caused the entire nations to lose faith in their democratic institutions, which gave birth to the rise of fascism in a desperate attempt. So what wow. you get is you get economic collapse, lost faith in democratic institution, mm -hmm. therefore, attempt through fascism, fascism to fix it, like an inevitable sort of cause and effect. Um, and he knows, he lived through that age, so he knows the descent into hell begins with the collapsing economy. So, you know, it could be an issue of correlation, but there is, his, his takeaway from is it, his takeaway was, if it can't control the financial institution, meaning through regulation and printing of money, people will empower a despot who will. Um, it and it's like based on his, well, it's based on his historical reasoning, right? And, that, and there's probably tons of other examples you can think of, not just as they relate to economics, where someone has some particular take on history, and that informs political conclusions or whatever else. I just wonder how he figured out that, or why he presumes that the cause is, is not the other way around that the fascism causes the economic collapse, not that the economic collapse causes the fascism. I like, would I say then, I would say to you then probably, let's say he lived through it. This is my guess, I I'm not speaking for him, but maybe something like, well, Hitler became popular and people listened to him when Germany went through the Great Depression. So it was like before that, to him, I guess he, maybe to him, Hitler represents fascism, whatever before that isn't fascism. He, and he's saying that, um, you know, that's what he saw, that, okay, Hitler rose when, when the economy collapsed. And maybe he's seen other instances of that economy collapsing. Then, then this despot rises after. It's not despot rises first, economy collapses. Maybe it is the case that economy collapse, despot rises, economy is worse, but the point is economy collapse came first, right? Well, then again, I think, personally, I think the cause of fascism is more social than economic anyway. Right. So I mean, I would disagree with him anyway, because yeah, okay. I can explain why fascism would come first. Right. But I see what you mean. Like there is a, a way to say that the economic collapse came first. Yeah. At least but chronologically, think, chronologically yes. we can say that, right? 
it might appear, but then you could argue when did fascism really start? Right. When do you call the start? Was right. it when Hitler was in Germany? Was it when Hitler stood on the in the beer hall and shot people? Or was it afterwards or after he came out of jail? I mean, there's right. it's hard to say which is the start. But wouldn't I say to you that it, like why would why would you say fascism started when Hitler didn't take over Germany yet? He still hadn't taken Germany. Well, then, because I think there's a lot there already that was implicitly okay. fascist. Okay, so then I think then that's the social right. causes. Right, 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 and that's the like a more conceptual level of analysis of fascism as opposed to purely what you see, as Hazlitt describes, with like people looking yeah. at what is seen. Yeah. Yeah, in some instances, of course, political movements could spawn from economic issues, but I think as far as fascism, I think it goes broader than that. Right, okay. Like some things in South America, I think, did spawn from economic issues primarily and not the other things, but in Europe, I think it was different. Right. Okay. I, I had a similar line of 